Eugene, welcome. It's so good to see you. Good to see you as well, Frank. And thank you so much for having me. I, I can't tell you how honored I am. Well, we're delighted to have you. You know, many of our listeners have gotten to know you through your conducting of the Durafle, certainly our introductions of other events, uh, the Rise Up webinar. Uh, and I thought it would be nice for them to get to know you as a musician uh, and as a person as well. Okay. So uh, you are a director of choirs and a professor of conducting at the University of Michigan. You are yes. the artistic director of the Washington Chorus. Yes. And the founding director of the Exigence Vocal Ensemble. Yes. <laughs> it's I, a lot. Have, have I left anything out? <laughs> I, nothing that needs to be mentioned right now. So <laughs> I am I am a married. So I so I, that is that would be an important factor. I do have a, a spouse and, and so that is a husband is pretty important as well. Yes, so. absolutely. Yes. <laughs> well, um, we'll get to those jobs in a few minutes, but I thought maybe we could begin. Tell us about your background in music. How did you make your way to being a professional musician in general? and then a conductor in, in specific. Sure, I'll do the, the condensed version of this. I will be here all day. Um, you know, I, I tell people this, for me making music, and for, at first that was through singing. I, I, I remember singing and walking and all of that, it, all, that. All of that seems like it happened at the same time. In other words, I, I, I can't remember not making music. I mean, it just was like talking to me. And I remember I would sing everywhere, up and down the dirt. I lived in the, I'm from rural Virginia. So I would walk up and down the roads just singing. I would have concerts on my back porch. And that really was the beginning of it for me. And, and, every, and because of that, people in my community said, I think he needs to sing. So let's give him a solo in church. So starting out honestly singing solos in church as a young boy from all that singing I then became the young singing boy in my whole area and would, would guests appear at local churches and my own church frequently as a soloist and so it wasn't until ninth grade that I began to take piano lessons with my junior high teacher Miss Daphne Smith who, and I, that's, she's the one that began formal training in music. It was, those were just black dots on a page for me before yeah. then. And it was through that experience that I realized, oh my gosh, and through her actually encouragement, you should consider doing this for a living. And I thought, I can, you know, I mean, <laughs> and so from there, I, I had started uh, working on my skills as a pianist. I started taking private voice lessons and then, uh, decided to major in music. Uh, finished my undergraduate, fast forward, at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Mm -hmm. Got my undergraduate in choral music uh, education. Originally, I wanted to be an opera singer. But after taking that first conducting class, I was hooked. You were hooked, right. Oh, my gosh. And I, I, I knew from that point on that that was my life's calling. I didn't know what, I didn't know how, but I knew it was conducting and working with people. Can you can you talk a little bit about that? What is it about conducting? Is it shaping a sound? Is it shaping a phrase? Is it uh, is it ordering people around? You like to tell people what to do? You know. Sure. You know, for me, at that what what hooked me right away was I, as a singer, you know, studying in college, I felt as if I couldn't always get my ideas across vocally. But somehow or another, when I was conducting, I felt more free to bring out and, and, and sort of also show the music, musical ideas that I had in, in my soul and in my being. And so right. I, I, that it, there was, whereas vocally, I was always limited by my lack of range or just lack of technique. So there was always a stopping point, whereas conducting, I felt like I didn't have those limitations. And that to me wow. felt free. It felt like riding a bike. You know, I mean, I just I just knew that I and then I love people. I mean, you know, I, I always tell my I students, think that comes across and just talking. <laughs> to you. I, nobody will be surprised. I, you know, I just 
I, you know, the thought of making music and working with people, I, I don't think there's anything better. And I always say, gosh, I get paid to do this, you right. know? Aren't, aren't we the lucky ones to experience, to get paid to do it, but to experience Mozart and Brahms and whomever oh. it is from the inside? Yes, you know? yes. And that is why, for me, I was addicted to conducting. So, uh, and, you know, I could go further with that story, but you, I'll let you tell me or ask questions if you want me to go further with that journey or not. So, Well, uh, I mean, a little bit. You made your way to University of Michigan. I as did. Right? As a master's uh, and doctoral student. And I stopped between each job and I taught high school for a while. I was with the Boys Choir of Harlem in New York City uh, uh -huh. for a, a while. And then uh, my first college position was at McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. While uh -huh. doing or holding these posts, I also was guest lecturing and guest conducting nationally and abroad. So that so th that's, was also happening simultaneously. And then through the years, Obviously, now I'm here at Michigan. I started Exigence and now in, in, with the Washington Chorus. So. Ah, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about uh, Exigence? I think that will be the job with which our listeners are least familiar. Sure. So talk about what kind of ensemble it is, why you started it, what mm -hmm. sorts of things you do. Yes, thank you for asking. Uh, Exigence feels like my, you know, I don't have any children that I have birthed but exigence feels like <laughs> that's Amazing. my one child because, you know, and I, I began to realize I, I was, first of all, honored to win the Sphinx Medal of Excellence Award. Right. And with that award, it, it's designed to encourage you to be entrepreneurial, you know, to go after a dream that you have, start something, you know, whatever that is. And I just felt as if um, I hadn't, I really hadn't said everything that I wanted to say about um, the Black and Latinx artistry or contributions to classical music. And through the Sphinx organization, who that they're now going into their 25th anniversary, which is literally a professional and youth organization designed to celebrate diversity in the arts, specifically championing the artistic contributions of Black and Latinx string players. And so through that, through that, that organization and my own passion, I partnered with them to create the vocal version of that organization where we would have, because I felt as if there was a lot of music happening in our country and definitely from all communities. But when one looks at the highest level of artistry with professional choirs, um, we saw very few Black and Latinx musicians in those ensembles, as well as conductors or groups. And so that's, that's the name, Exigence, which means a great need and high demand. We just felt like there was a great need for this, the repertoire, the, as well as the opportunity for these singers to show all of that, that range of talent. So oh, that's, that's that ensemble. And we're a project-based group. So we only meet about two to four times a year. We come together specifically for projects. The singers come from all over the United States and Mexico. And we premiere, we, the repertoire we sing is, is, I like to be very clear about it. We, anything that is pre-1900 will only be early music from our respective communities. Uh -huh. Anything from 1900 to the present will be any composer as well as specifically with a, a, a mission of championing new works by women and composers from the BIPOC community, specifically the Black and Latinx um, oh. uh, uh, audiences, so. Fascinating. So, uh, you know, just on a human level, how do you divide your time among these <laughs> three major, major jobs that you have? Do you, do you get any sleep, for example? <laughs> I uh, I hope you could sleep on a plane because I do. I I often am already asleep by the time we've taken off. I, those are my favorite when I wake up and it's like, oh, we've already we're already up in, in the air. So, um, how does one balance it? You know, I, I'll, I'll tell you. You just take it as it comes. I do have a system where I block out certain days or portions of days for certain work. And uh, of course things interject and, and I, you know, I, but I, as much as possible, try to keep my life 
organized that way because that's the only way I find that I'm the most productive than trying to do everything all at once. That is, of course, it's not a perfect science, but I, I have found by really saying this day is dedicated to the meetings and score study, et cetera, email for that area, I'm becoming more productive. Um, but I'm taking it as it goes, you know, that is that is just a part of it. I don't have, my, my spouse and I have an understanding. We both respect each other's work and I don't have children except for exigence. Yeah, so that right. allows me a lot of freedom and I love this work, you yeah. know? I mean, I have my studio feels like my children of eight graduate students. You know, I mean, how can you not love working with future conductors? Yes, the, right. you know, the Washington course, that strong community of committed singers who are passionate about choral music, that gives me that gets that gives me so much hope also when I see all these people whose lives are not dedicated just to professional music but they're so committed and that makes me want to work for them and, and collaborate. So I feel as if I'm very fortunate. And so the jobs feed me. It's not yes. just me yes. giving, they, it feeds my soul. You know, there's, what is the saying? If you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. Absolutely right. right. I can't say I fully, if I'm not quite there yet. It definitely yes, feels right. like work. <laughs> well, still has a bad day at the office, right? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, it also reminds me at, at BCI many years ago, David Starvinder, who was at that time the chorus director of the Metropolitan Opera, mm -hmm. uh, conducted for us several times uh, evenings of opera choruses. And during the question and answer session, uh, one of our choristers said to him, you know, you work at the Metropolitan Opera. How can you stand to work with a group of amateurs who've just come together this week? And he said, I'm paraphrasing. He said, when I work with a group like this, I see 200 uh, puppy dogs wagging their tails. <laughs> and, and, and it was the same idea, feeding off the energy yes. of, of those enthusiasts. Absolutely. <clears throat> Can you talk about a little bit about the different strata of uh, musicians that you work with? You know, you work with talented amateurs, you work with... Uh, students who are studying to be professionals, you work with professionals, you, you work with different, you know, uh, a little bit about maybe how your expectations are, are different or maybe your, maybe your expectations are the same, but you approach uh, your work uh, differently. Um, what comes to mind there? You're right on. That's, I love talk, you know, when I, you speak to another conductor, <laughs> they can't fully get it. You know, for me, Good music is good music. Great, uh, you know, excellence in terms of artistry. It, it, it has nothing to do with level for, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. I think it's the conductor's job to choose the right repertoire so that every group, every individual that you're working with can, can reach that level of artistry and that, so that they can achieve the highest I think most organic, expressive performance. So for me, that expectation is actually the same. What's different is possibly the repertoire. What's different is the, the amount of time I may give to that individual repertoire, uh -huh. how quickly I expect them to uh, come prepared or well-prepared. I expect them to come to that first rehearsal. For example, with exigence, they get repertoire sent to them ahead of time. They're expected to come with all the notes learned. Right. When I, when I think of the Washington course, we have a certain number of rehearsals that we may spend on a concert, obviously, whatever it takes. We'll, I, mean, you know, I plan that out so that we can spend as much time as we need, sectional time, whatever is needed to get that entire group to have the confidence and the quality that I know that they're capable of choosing. Mm -hmm. And then at the graduate level, it's the same. I, it is making sure that I choose the appropriate level of music with the amount of rehearsals that I have. So I, I think there's, for me, that energy is no different. My language for the most part is the same. Uh -huh. um, I may, I always assume how do I, this is my philosophy and my, my dear mentor, you know, used to say this all the time, expect first and only work backwards as needed. 
And so I, I never dumb down. I don't talk to people in such a way that makes them feel unintelligent or amusical. It's this, my whole thing is this is what's expected. And if I then have to break that down, become more kinesthetic or whatever that takes to get them to achieve it, I can do that. But I assume the highest uh, with who, whomever I'm working with. I love that. Expect first. I mean, this is what yes. I expect. And then you have plan B, C, and D if you need it. Exactly. You know? And we all need it, you know. We're all dancing on our feet, right? And that's really the key is knowing that score so well and having enough pedagogical um repertoire or tools in my background that at any moment I can become more uh, concrete or abstract as needed, depending on the, the situation. Because mm -hmm. so much of what we do is teaching in, in addition, yes. to, you know, teaching in order to, to build a sound, to build an ensemble. Uh, and now Eugene, with your strong vocal background, um, I assume that you work vocally with your ensembles. Um, to develop a sound. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, how your concept of vocal? Sure, I, I mean, obviously with the background and singing and that being my first, really, first exposure to music, I, I sound for me is everything. And it's, I, I, I like to say it is the tree from which all the branches flow, right? And from there, I, I approach rehearsal, the way I rehearse, is through vocalism, the way I, the colors that we use, I achieve through vocalism. To me, when you think about resonance, when you think about intonation, when you think about the communication of text, that's all through vocalism. So I use that to deal with a lot of also issues. I, I rarely say you're flat. I rarely say sing louder. I, always, I So I approach most of my problems from a vocal standpoint and how every, for me, for me, every style, every composer is gonna call for a slightly different vocal color. So how can we vary those colors? I use vocalism to really teach almost every aspect of the repertoire and, and address issues. So it's important to me. And I, I, for me, it's not about just the warmups. It's about using the actual music, the material given to us mm -hmm. to build that those that vocal um, vocalism, the vocal you know, you know agility, whatever is needed. So yeah, it's fascinating. You know, over the years at BCI, we've had so many different conductors with different backgrounds. Yes, and some are stronger in the vocal area, some are stronger in the instrumental area, uh, working with the orchestra, and it's sure. always fascinating to me the different ways in which people work. Yes, yes. <clears throat> Can we talk a little bit about repertoire, choosing repertoire um, mm -hmm. for these different ensembles uh, mm -hmm. that you work with. Um, I would assume that you choose repertoire that you enjoy, that you like, but also my guess is that when you're teaching at U of M, there's choosing repertoire as part of an education system. We need to cover various um, centuries, different styles, uh, uh, of music, that sort of thing. But also, are you choosing repertoire for the particular ensemble? Not only in terms of budget, excuse me, budget, but in terms of uh, what music they might enjoy performing as well. Yes, repertoire is, first of all, it's one of my favorite, choosing repertoire is one of my favorite parts of the job. I, I, I often tell my graduate students, I think your success is almost, 70 to 90 percent based on the repertoire you choose mm. because first you know gosh and let's dissect that for just a minute if you think about uh the difficulty level if it's too difficult and consistently too difficult the choir will not sing well and that will affect rehearsal that will affect their connection to you if you find yourself only choosing the same type of repertoire how does that affect audiences how mm. does that affect the ensembles or as I like to, I like to experience organic music making and expression. How does that affect that if they're sort of, oh, here we go, the same old routine again and again. So I, I, I take repertoire choosing very seriously. I believe repertoire also selection is mission based. I think every ensemble has a focus and a mission 
And so, for example, the University of Michigan, I tend to think of repertoire with the graduate level because I've got master's students and doctoral, and they're only there two to three years. How it can, in mostly those two years, how can the repertoire, when they look at that, can they see that they've got a well-balanced experience, exploring different styles, exploring different voices, different stories, um, different skill levels, and then also thinking about each individual group. The chamber choir is going to have a very different focus than our maybe a, a non-audition ensemble at the university. So, I, so it's in tandem, so the, the two-year model and the mission of the group affects that. Um, and then rehearsal time. How much time do I actually have if we're doing a, a Darius Milo's trilogy, you know, or a trilogy, that's a three and a half hour opera in French. You better believe the concert before that is probably going to be pretty easy. Yes, right. That's Schubert, <laughs> you know? Madison, G. You know. <laughs> exactly. Yes, right. And so, and then when I think about the Washington chorus, for us, gosh, that has to do with what's, what, is, what is the NSO asking us to perform? Uh -huh. And then what do we have to perform around that so that that's ready to go? And as well as what are our budgetary needs for the year in terms of the hall rental, the soloists, you know, so there's a lot of factors. But yeah. I'm also thinking with that group, when did they last do Elijah? When did they last program Haydn's creation, right. et cetera? Have they ever done Adolphus Hell Stork or you name it? And so how do I balance that with what they've done, with what I think we want to say to our audience, the community? Have we engaged enough with our local community? I mean, there's so many factors and then balancing the difficulty level with all of that. Right. Um, and exigence is a little different because we tend to, because we're project-based choir, we tend to do, we have, a, we have a body of repertoire that we add to and subtract, but we keep that body. You know, we always, so the, the people who've been with that group from the beginning, gosh, they have probably about two hours worth of music, but we then select from that, that wow. pool of repertoire, depending on the concert needs, the collaboration. Right. Um... Can you talk a little bit about how you've coped in the last year with uh, COVID and how it has affected um, vocal ensembles? Who knew that we were in such a dangerous profession? I know, gosh. <laughs> uh, have you been able to make any uh, live music uh, and, and how? And none of us has a crystal ball, but maybe your thoughts about going forward. Sure. Um, I've been very blessed at the University of Michigan. We, uh, with my chamber choir, were in person all year long. Wow. Uh, we started out 12 feet apart wearing masks. Uh, and so we were in a hall that sat about a thousand people and we were only 30. And we were literally spread out over that entire hall, which was very mm. difficult to... Yeah. 12 feet apart in each direction, wearing masks. And then we started off with only 30 minute chunks and then we had to rest for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. By the end of the year, we were nine feet apart and we were still masked, but we could rehearse for 110 minutes without having to leave the space. So, I, you know, I've, I've never been so happy to gain three feet in my life. You know, it seems so, <laughs> it sounds ridiculous. I, you know, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was so excited to go from 12 to nine feet. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, but, we, but at least though, and that was really important for the graduate students. And I, for the most part, gave my graduate students the podium time because I don't need to rehearse a choir for practice, right? I mean, but they need that. And that was the only in person. The Washington course, we've been all online um, and we've had actually a wonderful year for the most part producing content, digital content. And it's really... I think it's broadened our connection to diverse communities. We've connected with you all and, and collaborated with obviously the singers from the Berkshire community. We've expanded our audience. We expanded our roster. We have members in our choir from Singapore, from Kentucky, mm -hmm. from Michigan, from California. I mean, so even though it was all online, our, our engagement to a much broader community. And I think it's also has been wonderful. And I also think with the chorus, I think it's made them appreciate and value that this community more than ever. And we're so excited about coming back together uh, this summer even. So. Isn't that interesting? You know, 
necessity is the mother of invention, right? Yes. You come up with things that you never thought of uh, <laughs> because, because we had to. And, oh, well, this may work out very well for us yes. uh, out of adversity. You know, in terms of thinking out of the box and having to create new content, one of the projects that I'm most excited about is with the Washington Chorus, we created a, a short music film that was filmed virtually, recorded virtually, uh, of a new work commissioned just for this time called a cantata for a more hopeful tomorrow. If any of your audience members have not seen this work, I would encourage them. It's on Vimeo. You can, you can watch it there. You can hear the music uh, on all the streaming platforms, but it's it's a powerful work. It's a COVID, the movie is a COVID-19 story that's set to a new work by Damien Jeter uh, called A Cantata for More Hopeful Tomorrow. And it goes from um, really lost to hope. And oh. I really think when I think of this year, that's how I feel, you know, from lost to hope. And it, yes, he uses, yes, absolutely. He uses the cantata, Weidenklagen, Sorgen, Sagen as the impetus, the, the sort of the kernel for the first movement and elements of that work are used throughout, as well as using spirituals, a couple of spirituals as well in the work as, as songs of hope, uh, even in the midst of struggle. It's a powerful work and it's a, it's a with a virtual film. I, that would have never happened had we not yes, right. been in this time. So that, you know, mother of invention, there you go. I mean, <laughs> it's... A, well, Eugene, thank you so much. It's been great talking with you and getting to know you a little bit better as a person and as a musician. And if you'll stick around, we'll have a, a question and answer period with our, our listeners. So thank, thank you so much. What a pleasure. Thank, thank you, Frank. I, I just am so honored to have met you and worked with you all year. And I hope this is the beginning of many, many more collaborations. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat>